create and 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 you see like sometimes like look at this thing little thing right here it's it's not even like intended like sometimes when i draw when i think like on organic shapes sometimes i allow my hand to do things that like i i, I kind of let it loose I sometimes like I, I I want those like happy mistakes. Like I kind of let my hand do like add different details. Welcome back, everyone, to the Magma Classroom. The long-awaited return of Udi Kalmanovich is here. Udi, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. It's uh, it's wonderful to be back. Wonderful. It's good to have you back. Uh, folks in the community have been asking about you and, and where you've been. Udi's, Udi's been traveling and doing some stuff for work, but today we're going to be focusing on eyes. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about like uh, how to draw eyes and... Uh, I plan to do, to to go like to to dive deep and and even talk about a little bit the anatomy of the eye and the structure and like get maybe give everyone everyone a better understanding about like how everything works. So once you know the why, uh, the what is uh, easier mm. or, or the how, right? Right. Mm, that sounds fantastic. I always thought I've always felt with eyes in particular. It's, there's so many distinct shapes. There's so many different like angles and curves that can occur in the shape of the eye. And we know this now, I feel like <laughs> with customization for video game characters, you start to like get a real insight into the different shapes that can be you know, selected. But in terms of like creating it organically and understanding all that stuff, that's a, that's a very cool subject. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and you know, it, it goes like it, it's so, uh, um, it's so uh, diverse, like, uh, because if you talk about eyes, you got like the realistic eye. And then when you start to like stylize things, uh, it goes like, um, it, go, it, it actually becomes more complicated, uh, I believe, than, than the realistic eye, because like the structure sometimes, it, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, if you think, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, if you think today, like these days, you have like a lot of characters that until, let's say, like until 15, 20 years ago, we saw those characters only on uh, 2D uh, animated series or a series or uh, um, animated movies. And now you see those characters in 3D animation. And you have a character that was only like she was created in 2D and now when it's 3d it actually needs to make sense like how the eye looks from the front and how it looks from the side so in 2d you can actually lie uh, uh, as much as you like you can make the eye look a certain way from the side and it really it really doesn't represent the the real the real way uh, like the, the actual way it would look uh, from the side if it, if you make those uh, this character in 3d so uh, it's kind of interesting that is incredibly interesting. I, I mean, I've spent a lot of time, you know, I've spent a lot of time more of my, I feel like more of my creative career in, in, in 3D and sculpting than in 2D. So like the breakdown for this is exciting for me to see how you think about this stuff and, and what you got to share. That sounds, that sounds awesome. Yeah, that, that, I think, I think it will be great. Uh, do we, uh, do we have any participants uh, for today? Um, so I assume we will. Um, I, I think standard. We can follow the standard procedure of um, going through the the lecture, and then we'll see. Uh, I actually am gonna. It's Discord community is aware, so I feel like people people tend to just jump in when they excellent, when they can. Excellent, excellent. I'm just asking, uh, so can, can I can uh, kind of uh, plan how to divide the the way I'm going to approach it. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think we can jump right in, right? Yeah, they are. Uh, so I, I, I'm actually going to start with something that is uh, very, very simple. And I want to talk about what not to do. So um, I think that it, it goes like I, I will begin with like the very, very basic level. But there are, there are some things that people uh, that are drawing 
And I'm talking about obviously uh, drawing from imagination and not uh, like drawing from observation. I'm like the drawing from imagination guy. So um, there, there are some things that uh, people tend to do when they draw eyes from imagination. And it's mostly uh, due to the fact that once we imagine things or try to draw from memory, we memorize icons. We kind of simplify simplify everything in our mind and we memorize icons. So if you go to, if you approach even, even a child and ask him to draw an eye, he will probably create something like this. I'm, I'm about to create the ugliest eye ever. Um, so let's say, uh -oh, uh -oh. I just need you to let me uh, draw on the layer. And oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hmm? Or should I create a new one? Okay, that's great. So you'll probably see something, and I'll actually grab a different brush, something that looks like this. And that's the first thing we want to avoid and uh, not do. Now, when I say don't do something, obviously we can do whatever we want. Uh, when I say don't do it, it's mostly due to the fact that it, it doesn't really exist in real life or there might be uh, some more interesting ways to, to, to do stuff. But what I mean by that is that this shape, basically, it's not a, a shape that we will encounter in real life when we look at eyes. Uh, and that's for a few reasons. First of all, the eye is not symmetrical. So if I'll divide this shape right in the middle, we will see that this shape is kind of symmetrical. The left side looks like the right side, and uh, basically, a, a realistic eye or the true eye is not symmetrical. Now, even though I don't want to draw realistic character right now, uh, when we're when we draw in characters, we do like draw things from reality. So, like everything we do with simplified characters is kind of exaggeration or stylization of things we see in reality and and. I will go more into depth about that uh, later on. So first of all, we want to try to avoid making the eye symmetrical. The second thing, you will also notice that this eye is also symmetrical, symmetrical between like the top part and the bottom part. So it's also equal like this part looks the same as this part. And this is something that also uh, will kind of look unnatural because in a realistic eye or in most of the eyes that we will see uh, the top part is it doesn't look like the bottom part and actually the bottom part is most of the time um, a little bit more flat where the top part is a little bit more uh, arched uh, so this is the first thing we want to avoid the second thing we want to avoid to draw uh, the iris uh, where it's too small and when I say too small, I mean that if I'll draw the iris like this, uh, you can see right now that I have like a bit of space left here and a bit of space left here. I'll actually zoom in. Um, and I'm not talking about uh, like um, those cases where you draw something that is, uh, I don't know, I can draw an anime character that uh, a, a, a hammer just fell down on her toe and her eyes are shrinking and I don't know what. So I'm not talking like on those exceptional cases. I'm talking about, like, I'm, I'm drawing like a, a regular humanoid uh, character uh, and usually, and you can test it uh, for yourself. If you look at the mirror or if you look at a, a, a person and he looks straight at you, right? Like right now, I'm looking straight at the camera. When you look straight, then the iris will actually touch the upper lid and also the bottom lid. So that means that when we draw the iris, I actually want the iris 
to touch, or let's just do this. I want the iris to touch the upper lid and also touch the bottom lid. Okay, and not like have it like floating in the middle of the eye. And uh, obviously, if uh, I'm looking up, then it will touch the upper lid and I might have a little bit of space uh, under it. Uh, and the same ways, if I look down, that in, it will touch the bottom lid and I'll have space uh, above the iris. But um, like, even if you try to look at the mirror, and, and like really open your eyes and make the iris like be exactly in the middle and not touch each one of the lids, you will find it's kind of difficult. You, you can do it. You can do it like not knowingly. Like let's say if somebody spooks you or surprises you or whatever, uh, it will happen naturally. But if you will actually try to, uh, I'm going to do a crazy look like straight at the camera, it's actually, it's actually kind of hard to do it. Uh, so just know that. So if you create the iris too small, it will make the eye look unnatural and also kind of crazy. Um, so that's another thing we want to avoid. The next thing we want to avoid is uh, about like drawing the eyelashes. So a lot of time uh, you will see people doing eyelashes like this. And... Uh, there are a few reasons why we don't want to do that. The first one is like the direction of the eyelashes. Like eyelashes, they don't really go up. They actually go like outside to the front and a little bit diagonally to the side and they have kind of a wavy motion to them. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing, which is actually even more important, I think, is that people tend to draw what they know and not what they see and that means that because i know in my mind that the ash the eyelashes are made from like those separated hair tiny hairs then i'm thinking of tiny hairs and then i draw them but if we will actually look at someone and look at the eyelashes most of the time those tiny hairs will kind of like gather together to tiny groups of hair and they will create different shapes. Um, and also, most of the time when we talk uh, to, to someone or we look at the person, we don't really like come really close to his face. It's kind of uh, weird, right? So usually if you're in a kind of a normal space distance from someone you're speaking to, then you will look at from you look at the eyes from kind of a distance it's like right now if even right now when you can you can see my face inside the frame of the camera you can't really tell like the the spacing between one tiny hair and the other the eyelashes kind of become like this one homogenic shape uh, that really just like make the eye look more um what is the word i'm looking for like more uh, bold like more um highlighted or Mm. I have the word in Hebrew. I don't know it in English, <laughs> but it just like make it it, it, it. it will actually look like kind of this dark stroke uh, on top of the eye, more than actually tiny hairs. So uh, it will actually be uh, wise to approach it like a shape, like maybe create like this shape that is made from all those tiny hairs coming together and believe it or not that will actually work better than create those tiny hairs separated from one another and i, I will explain how uh, how i draw eyelashes uh, a little bit more in depth uh, later but it's it's another thing we want uh, to avoid so basically uh, these are a few things that uh, I want uh, for everyone to uh, try to avoid and not do. And uh, let's talk about what we do want to do. So let's start with the first thing we talk about, about avoiding making the eye symmetrical, the top and the bottom and the left and the right side. Um, so there is a, as so said there are many different um shapes of eyes but 
there is one like particular shape which is thought to be like let's say like the average shape or the ideal shape and obviously when it comes to like different uh, faces and eyes and and structures uh, there is no ideal anything but it's probably maybe the most common i am and i'm not even sure if that's correct but uh, it's like when you learn about proportion uh, we, we are being taught about the average proportions or the ideal proportions and there's not really such a things because it you you have to ask yourself where do you get your measurements from like if i'll try to look at the average uh, eye shape in africa or in japan or in mongolia or in hawaii or in united states or in israel it will change obviously but we do need kind of a setting point so if we throw everything uh, out the window and we say uh, and we'll say there is no uh, such thing as uh, an average or a starting point uh, an average shape then basically um we need to learn like thousands of eyes or millions of eyes so we kind of a need of a setting point like say okay this is will be like my basic eye and then i can go off that uh, i can uh, I can say, okay, this eye is more angular comparing to this eye. This eye is a little bit more rounded, uh, rounded in comparison to this eye, and so on. So let's uh, see what we do with like this basic uh, eye. So for the top lid, which is actually the top curve uh, of the eye, for this top curve of the eye, actually I want to divide it to like three diagonal lines uh, sometimes it can be taught to be divided to four uh, and the length of each one of them uh, can actually change from a person to person so it doesn't really matter the thing is which is more important is in the end result uh, to avoid like the symmetry of this uh, curve so right now I will do it like really angular to get the point across. So what I'm doing is I'm creating like this diagonal line and then another diagonal line, which is a bit longer maybe. And then another diagonal line, which is like a little bit in a sharper angle, like so. Um, and obviously when I'll draw like an actual eye, I will actually around those corners and I'll round those uh, diagonal lines a little bit so it won't look like this uh, jagged lines uh, but it basically it what helps me to understand like the curvature that I want to achieve so let's say I'm creating something like that now for the bottom lid the bottom lid is actually most of the times is a little bit more flat than the top lid, uh, hence the avoidance from the, the symmetry. So instead of doing the same things and achieve another symmetrical line, uh, I, what I will do is I will actually create a very short diagonal line and then probably just like make this curve or this straight line and attach it. Um, so if I'll do it and I'll make it a little bit more rounded it will probably look like something like this and if you want to draw the tear duct like this red tiny thing that we have in the corner of the eye in the inner corner uh, you can choose to do so but i want to also uh, explain something about uh, about the tear duct and uh, that you, you you do need to keep in mind when you draw a character, try to think like about the distance and about the amount of details uh, you want to convey in your style. So if your character is very simplified, um, you probably want to let go of, so of certain details. Uh, and maybe this will be one of them. You want to create a simpler shape and actually keep what is important and like Every, every little thing that is, is not that important to the overall shape, you can actually uh, just uh, avoid. And another thing is, is the distance. If I'm 
drawing a character and I'm drawing a full body character. I see it from the feet to the head and so on. Then probably that means that the character is standing uh, in, in a, a far distance from the camera or the viewer. And that means that he won't see every tiny details. Uh, the same way that if I'll move right now away from the camera in such a way that you will be able to see a full body image, uh, you probably won't be able to see my tear duct, okay? So it's another thing to keep in mind. Like details are uh, something that uh, affected from uh, the style itself and the amount of details in the style, but also think about distance and see, think about like if you're uh, creating, um, if you're drawing with lines, think about the line weight. So if uh, you're doing like tiny details, but you're working with a thicker line, um, those tiny details will uh, be too, too visible and they will have too much contrast and they will actually be distracting so you can avoid them and uh, let them go together so let's say that i uh, chose to actually uh, do show the, the steer duct and now i want to create the iris so as i said before um, the iris usually come in contact with the upper lid and the bottom lid and you will see i think that for me when i i read like different books and saw different tutorials and you see like um the, the suggestions of trying to divide the eye uh, to third to thirds and then like making the iris one third of the eye and i feel that um it's kind of incorrect uh, at least for me from observation i feel that it's kind of incorrect and uh, also once you start to stylize and create different eyes maybe your eye is a little bit uh, more open or a little bit more wide and what do you do in, in like different cases so basically if you create a circle and you decide that it touches the top part and the bottom part it kind of fixes your size anyways so i don't want to create a circle where it goes like really really under the, the, the leads like this circle goes really under the leads right no what i want to create is like a circle an iris that like barely touches the upper lid and barely touches the bottom lid and if we think of an exact circle then it means that once it touches the top lid and one is once it touches the bottom lid that means that it already uh, fixed the size for me uh, so it's another thing that uh, you can actually take into consideration uh, when deciding on the height uh, on the size of the iris and also if you dividing if you do want to divide the eye to third so don't divide like the inner part of the eye try to divide like the entire width of the eye and that will be a little bit more exact so for me when i uh, draw the iris i just kind of try to really barely touch the upper part and the bottom part and usually that is kind of uh, gives me the correct size and something that looks uh, kind of natural and um, so that ab about the size of the iris and um let's talk a little bit about the inside of the iris and what i, I want to show now about the inside of the iris uh, will actually mm, 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 let's uh, merge this down and uh, what i will want to show about the inside of the iris will be relevant not only to drawing simplified characters and stylized characters and drawing with line art it will actually be relevant for understanding the, the structure of the eye better and the structure of the iris better and uh, it will be relevant also if you want to render characters or draw a, a more realistic characters so <clears throat> there are a few things about the way the iris looks 
that you can also learn and get from observation. But I feel like that if you understand a little bit better the build or the structure of the eye, it makes much more sense. So first of all, let's talk about the pupil. The pupil is actually a hole inside in the middle of our eye. And we can think of this hole, it's like a camera shutter. So basically, it's a, it's a hole inside uh, our eye, in the middle of our eye, that can like grow or shrink, okay? It can open or close and basically uh, decide or um, kind of, uh, uh, it makes the amount of light that goes inside our eye. So we know that every time we look at a bright light, our pupils like shrink. And every time we're in the dark, our pupils are getting wider. And that's basically because the, we're in, we're in, we are in the dark and we don't have enough light coming in, then our pupils are, are coming wider to allow more light to come uh, to, to get inside the eye. And when we have a lot of light, our pupils are shrinking to actually try to manage and not to have so, so much light coming inside our, inside our eye. So what I'm getting, uh, what I'm trying to get across that regarding the pupil, there isn't such thing as like an average size, okay? Because, because the pupil is, is, uh, um, is uh, so much like a, um, a, it, it can change like from the environment and the amount of light that is the in the environment itself. There is no such thing as an average uh, pupil or uh, average size. Uh, what is the average lighting? Um, I don't know. So basically, you can think of like if you're drawing like a portrait and um, you're doing like, like a portrait where you can see the eyes like uh, in detail, you can actually think of what what is the environment in in this portrait like am, am i uh, creating a portrait of someone standing like in the studio lighting or someone standing outside in like a daylight uh, does he have like something that uh, casts shades over his eyes maybe he has a hat maybe he's standing the shades so we, you can actually keep it in mind and 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 take it into consideration when you draw the eye or on the other hand, you can approach it like um, strictly like graphical and visual and decide, no, I feel like that I want to, uh, the people to be in, in this particular size because I think it looks better. So just something to consider. But uh, right now, I will create, I think that if you don't want to think about it too much, you can actually make it a third of the iris, uh, which will look, uh, fine uh, so let's put this pupil right in the middle here and um, one more thing i think i'll actually make it a tad bigger and uh, one more thing uh, about pupils is i want to show you something like sometimes you will draw the eye and you will draw the eye like let's say looking up okay so let's say I drew some kind of an eye here and uh, I want this eye to look up. And because this eye looks up, I will draw the iris this way. And what happens a lot of times is when people drawing the eye looking up, then they want to actually put the pupil inside and they're doing something like this. And what happens here is basically that it's more intuitive for us to put the pupil right in the middle of the iris. But if we think about it, this iris go because the eye looking up, this iris basically goes under the lid. And that means that this pupil is not even close to be in the middle. So when you draw an eye, when uh, your character looking up, looking down, try to actually consider the full size of the iris and even the part of the iris that you don't see that goes under the lids and then take it into consideration when you think about the placement of the pupil inside the iris so this uh, 
pupils should probably be somewhere around around here and not in the place not where i placed it uh, initially so that's one more thing and let's go back to uh, our example another thing that if you take a look at different eyes another thing you will notice that our iris actually has like a thicker stroke around it so and this stroke usually usually it composes uh, or it, it's in the same color of the eye just in a darker tone so that means that if you will have like let's say brown eyes if you look closely at your iris you will see that it has like a darker brown stroke around it if you have green eyes mostly the actually with green eyes most mostly the the stroke around it will be kind of brownish um, and there are some people that the stroke around the iris can be in a different color than the eye itself so it's kind of interesting but that means that once you drew the iris if you want to render an eye or actually to get into more details just just know that the eye really has like this dark dark stroke around it so it's not something that is uh it's not a stroke uh, that i'm doing due to a style that i want to convey or achieve uh, it's actually a stroke that exists uh, really exists around the iris uh, so that's another thing and if we look at the pattern that goes inside the iris so this pattern is actually if you ever if you look at a the muscle then a muscle is composed of like fibers right so actually the eye or the iris is kind of the same way it's like a muscle that can contract and when it contracts the pupil uh, basically shrinks and then it can also like be loose and then the pupil gets uh, uh, becomes wider so what will be so what will be like the opposite word than like contracting when it goes like with muscles um it i mean a contract it's like it it's not expanded but um uh, relaxes maybe relaxes yeah, I mean, uh, yeah yeah but there's a better word i'm having a hard time coming up with it myself yeah <laughs> my excuse yeah. is it's early i, I i'm just <laughs> it's too early so. right <laughs> Uh, so basically, if you think of the iris like like these fibers of a muscle, it's basically fibers of a muscle that goes around the pupil. So and obviously, like different people, they actually have like different patterns to those fibers and to those shapes inside the, the iris. That's why the same way you can the, um, open your phone with like a fingerprint. Um, sometimes you know that uh, you see in the movies the when you want to go inside the secret room in the cia you have an eye scanner uh, because it's like a fingerprint everyone has like a different pattern uh, inside the eye but to create it basically what you want to do is try to think that if this is the pupil it's like drawing the sun so basically you have like different lines going from the pupil uh, outside and around the center what you want to do is make sure that those lines are not uh, equal to one another not in the length and not in the space so if you want to avoid doing something that looks like like this you you want to make it look more like organic more natural so try to really uh, vary the the length and the spaces around those lines that's one thing and then if you really 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 want to go into detail you can actually create different shapes around some of those lines uh, which will become more instinct and more uh, like more interesting but that's like goes into like high detail if you actually want to really show the texture of the iris so if I'm doing something that is a bit more uh, simplified, then I don't need to go into so much detail. I'll just create like those few lines to try to give the feeling of a texture around the eye. 
if you were doing like a super high res, uh, have you have you ever experimented with using like radial tools for things like this? Do you is it better to have individual strokes for for original lines and things like that? I think that every time that you use like something like a radial tool, it, it might look more uh, artificial. Yeah. Um, but I think it actually can can be a great tool for certain styles. Like let's say if you're drawing like a vector style eye, which should be like more graphical and less natural, then it actually might work or might be better even. Um, for me, it's something that if if I'm really drawing a character, then the eye will actually be much smaller than I won't draw an eye that size. And it's something that I will do like very quickly and very swiftly. And uh, I, I won't think about it too much. So I probably won't approach like a different tool to, to create it. Um, actually, I, I had a student which was, she had like a very, very interesting cool profession. She, she works at the hospital and uh, in the eye, I don't know how to say department, whatever. And I her you. job, and her job is actually to photograph uh, with um, obviously a special uh, equipment. She photographs like the, the eye of um, people that have all certain uh, sorts of issues with their sight. And she, she actually shared with me like uh, different uh, uh, images that were amazing because you, you can't even like imagine like the shapes and the different thing that you can see like inside an eye it's like like it's like looking at the clouds and start like imagining different things inside there it's kind it of is amazing. it is strange uh, is it opt optometrist uh or yeah optometrist? yeah but but Something like she works like with um like um with a like a, with a, a surgeon like uh, it's not Got like it. something that you do like just to to get like new glasses it's like people that actually have like um say, you know maybe like the even tumors or uh, yeah uh, i watched the or... uh i watched the the i mean i i watch it all the time the cosmos the 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 sort of follow-up to carl sagan's cosmos with neil degrasse tyson and the opening title animation is beautiful and they do a, an incredible high-res close-up of the eye particularly of this particular area of the eye and it and it and you think that it's mountains because it, it's so close up it's just these huge valleys of these tears and then all of a sudden you zoom on and it's the eye and it, and it feels a little strange because it's like you don't think of it as that textured inside of that space actually actually you know what if if we'll have like a time like uh, near the end of the stream maybe i will find some of the images because i cool. actually asked her i actually asked her to to send me some of the images and uh, i wanted to draw on top of them because like when I saw those images, I saw like all those different shapes. Like I saw birds and I saw different, I saw wow. different stuff inside, inside those images. And I, I, and I felt like, man, it would actually be cool to create like different illustration from those images. That's a great idea. <clears throat> Nobody so steal maybe, that. That's Udi's idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trademark. Um, okay. So, so let's continue with, uh, the iris. So, Let's say that right now for achieving like just like uh, this feeling of a little bit of texture, that's uh, enough for me. Um, now I want to show you another thing, which is actually um, regarding shading the iris. So obviously right now I'm not doing like a real shading rendering thing, but it's something that it is important to note if you do want to like render eye and make uh, the eyes and make them look a bit more realistic. So basically, let's say if I wanted to really like shade this eye right now, what will happen is that I will create, um, no, let's do it. Like so. I will create a certain tone. A certain tone for the eye itself. Say that I will do something like so. And then if my light source coming, let's say from the sky, let's say it's daylight and the light source coming from above, then I will grab a darker uh, tone 
and I will actually make the upper part of the iris a little bit darker. Like so, and then I will even grab a bit of darker tone and it will make the up, the really like the most upper or whatever, like closer to the top, I will make it even a little bit darker. Now, what's the reasoning behind what I just did? So it actually goes to the structure of the eye. So if we will look at actual anatomy of the eye from, let's say, from the side view. So let's say this is the eye and I'm not an eye doctor or anything. It's like in very stupid guy uh, 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 explaining. Okay, so let's say this is the eye. And basically the pupil, it's a hole. It's like this cavity in the middle of the eye. So all the light coming is go going inside this cavity. Now, let's imagine that the iris, it's like a muscle that contracts around this cavity. So this will be the iris. And on top of that, we have like this dome shaped lens. And it's actually, it's not really a lens, like the lens of the eye is actually inside the eye, which is something different but it's kind of a protective layer that goes on top of the eye. So basically what happens is that if we have light source coming from above, so let's say this is direction of the direction of our light. So if the light source coming from above, it can do, it can't do this. It can suddenly turn and light the upper part of the iris. What will happen basically is the light source will go through this lens and it will hit the bottom part of the iris. And that's the reason why when we look at the eye, if the light source is coming from above, the bottom part of the iris will be lit where the top part of the iris will be in shade. And also, if we go and really look under the, the top lid, then it goes even a little bit darker, but that's already something else that's actually due to the cast shadow of the eye itself, so of the lid itself. So that cast shadow could, can even go on the white part. Mm -hmm. That cast shadow can even go on the white part uh, of our eye because that's actually the cast shadow of the lids, of the top lid. So we already, I shared it a little bit. So that basically will be the reason why we will see the top part of the, of the iris dark and the bottom will be a uh, a, a little brighter basically and obviously that uh, that will change if the direction of the light source will change so if the light source is coming like let's say from the right so basically the left side will be lit and the right side will be in shade you can also uh, imagine like the iris uh, when i show it to my students i kind of compare it to like a speaker like if you, if you look at the speaker, like a, an audio speaker, like the mind, uh, mind brains inside of the speaker, uh, which looks something like this, right? So let's say we have a speaker. Something like this, right? So when you look at the speaker, <clears throat> the, the center of the speaker is actually dented. It goes inside. So if I had like a, a volume line, this is actually a dent, right, in the speaker, something like this. So that means, again, that if the light is coming from above, if light is coming from above, this light will hit the bottom part and not the top part of the speaker. You can also think of it as like a bowl. 
So let's say we have like a bowl of cereal, right? Something like this. And I put this ball on the side. And the, actually the pupil is like in the middle of this ball. It's right here. So even here, if I'm bringing my light from the top, that means that right now, if the light is coming from the top, that means that basically this part will be in shade and the bottom part will be lit. Okay? Same way. So basically this is how the iris uh, works or um, basically how it uh, um, being affected from the, from the light coming. And another thing that regarding the way we see the eye and the iris specifically, it's about the highlight or the reflection of the light source. So once we have the light source coming, then the, eye, the light source is also being reflected because the eye is, the eye is wet and the wet materials have like this uh, reflection, reflective attribute to them then we will also see the reflection of the light source and here it's something that probably is like for me it's it's kind of funny when you look at different eyes especially when you look uh, at anime eyes so when you, sometimes when you look at, at different anime eyes it kind of have like which are beautiful and it's like it's their own thing right so let's say that i have like an eye look something like this so I'm creating something let's say that I have something like this and I have like this big iris over here and I have like this big pupil and then and then really quickly I will give it a little bit of tone. And then usually what we see is that all of a sudden we have like all sorts of reflective shapes and different shapes here and here and a lot of reflect. So it's, it looks like very, very impressive and very like bright and, but we have to think that basically every highlight that we see inside the iris, it's actually another light source. So obviously we can do whatever we want and we don't have to like try to be um, limited to how it works uh, in real life. But basically uh, an highlight uh, all it is, it's a reflection of a light source. So if you have one light source in your scene, that means that you will only see one highlight uh, in the eye. And if you look at uh, a, an eye that has like, I don't know, let's say two uh, different uh, spots uh, of highlight, that means there are two different light sources. Sometimes you will look at, the, at an eye and you will see the highlight has like this rectangle uh, shape to it because maybe the light source is a window or maybe the light source coming from like a studio lighting when you have like this light box or something. So that's basically it. So if you want like to draw Nowadays, again, that's, like, uh, that's, it's, it's a lot of rings. A lot of ring lights. Yeah, <laughs> correct. And and you can actually see it. Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, you can actually see it. You see like this highlight and you see <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. You see like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're correct. The, you can actually see it. You know, you, you see someone streaming like, uh, and sometimes you can actually see it. That's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, Right now, if I go back to this eye, so if I have one single light source coming from the top, because that's the direction of the cast shadow I did inside uh, the iris, that means that I will see the highlight probably uh, in the middle. Uh, mm -mm -mm. 
I'm not on the right layer. Let's do it right here. Oh, I'm not on the right layer again. So let's do it right here. I'll probably see it right in the middle and I can decide if it's square or rounded or what I exactly I want to do with it. But I will create one single highlight. And also it's important to note that the highlight doesn't have to be uh, only on the iris. Like the white part of the eye uh, is also reflective and uh, we can actually see highlights on the white part as well. And sometimes even like in, in the bottom of the, of the eye where it meets the bottom eyelid, sometimes we can see um, highlights there as well. But right now, that will uh, be enough. And um, now, let's talk a little bit what goes around this eye. So one thing to note is that let's, let's actually create uh, uh, the, the, the leads. So I talked uh, uh, previously on not trying to avoid doing this and not creating like separate lines. So once again, if you are creating like this portrait and you're looking at the eye from close distance, then obviously you can definitely see the leads and you can definitely see different tiny hairs. So uh, you can see a lot of images and drawings of an eye where you can really see the, the eyelashes. Um, but if you're looking at a character from a distance, and I think that that's what I want like more to focus on right now. So even right now that I'm drawing the eye uh, from like in, in very close distance, um, I still want to, to show how I will approach it if I'm drawing like a full character, because when I'm drawing a full character, I'm not seeing the eye like from such a close distance. So then I will probably uh, try to create all those like eyelashes in kind of uh, one more simple and, and more stylized shape. The way I try to think about it right now, I'm looking at the eye from a front view, but if you will look at the eye, let's say from a three quarters view. So let's say that this is the eyeball, right? So this is the eyeball. And let's say that on top of this eyeball, I can actually see the upper lid. It has a little bit of thickness to it. And then I can see the bottom lid it has a little bit of thickness to it as well. So let's say that this is like the eyeball and I see it from a three quarters view. What I try to imagine, imagine like you have like a small uh, brim just like uh, on top of the hat, right? You have like a small brim that casting shadow um, uh, on the eye. So I'm trying to really simplify it. And what I imagine is that I have something that looks like this. I have like this coming out, coming a little bit outside, and I have this coming a little bit outside. And let's create like this arc here, and then another arc here. So basically I have this shape that casting shadow on the eye. And the reason I'm showing it like this is because I really want to simplify it. And I want you to imagine like a 3D shape. And that's the way to start realizing basically how it will look and how can I try to sketch it and approach it from different angles. What if I'm looking at drawing a head looking up or drawing a head looking down. So I kind of need a simple 3D shape that I can try to imagine how it looks from different angles. So let's say if I'm really drawing an eye, I don't know, maybe facing in this direction. And then again, I have the upper lid here and I have the top, uh, sorry, the bottom lid, let's say around here. And then I can approach it the same way. I can say, okay, it starts here, it goes here, and maybe I'll see this shape in this way. So I'm trying to think of a very simple shape that I can like imagine or like very rawly sketch. And then I'll try to build the simplified or the stylized shape of the leads on top of that shape. It's just a guide. It just shows me the perspective and the general direction of the eyelids. So 
let's go back to our eye, which facing the front. And probably what I will do is I'll try to make all those. I really like to use like the last of rush tool uh, when I'm creating different shapes. So I probably if I'm lucky, uh, I can hit it all at once. Let's see. So I'm creating like those different spikes. It actually becomes a little bit shorter. Uh, the closer I, we get to the inner part of the eye. I think here I can actually make those a little bit longer. But basically, that's mostly it. And even though it looks like very, very simple, if we look at like this eye and we start to zoom out a little bit, so if we start to zoom out a little bit, see the effect that it, it gives us and try to imagine that if I drew like an entire character or face that is a little bit in the distance, that will still be like a big size for the eye. Like try to think like the, the way you see characters in comics or in animated series, when you see like full, full uh, character, that will still be a big size. So when you look at it from a distance, it really like give the impression, okay, I see, I see the eyelids like kind of making the, the eye more uh, bold uh, on, from the top. And from the, on the bottom lid, I really try to be very, very subtle. I, I won't create like all those uh, leads. Usually on the bottom leads, the eyelashes are a little bit more spaced uh, from one another and they're usually shorter and there are less of them. So I will probably create like maybe a small shape of a few leads and then another small shape. Uh, so I'll create something that is very, very like, just to give uh, the feeling that there is also something there, but I'll try to be like very, very careful with it. And most of the time, if I'm not sure if I want to add the bottom eyelashes, if I want to add them or not, then I usually decide to not add them at all. So if, if I'm not sure that I want to show them or if, if they are supposed to be like uh, visible in the size or distance that I'm drawing the character, then I really... I, most of the time, I probably choose not to draw them at all. Um, so this is how I mostly uh, approach drawing the eyelashes. Now, let's talk about the eyebrow and then the eyelids, because when we talk about the eyelids, it's actually becoming much more interesting because the eyelids actually and the eyebrow itself are really affected by the shape of the skull. And if you want to know really what going, goes on like, and what really um, determines the way the eyelid will look and, and the way the eyelid folds inside, then you really know, need to know like how like the orbital looks and how the eyeball is placed inside the orbital and how the eyelids actually are folding inside the orbital. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but first, I will say just uh, something quick about eyebrows. Um, obviously, eyebrows come in many different shapes, and we have like eyebrows that are uh, maybe a little bit fixed, and, and those that are more natural, and some of them are like really uh, thin, and some of them are thick. But like the general idea, if we're trying uh, again to kind of uh, decide on a setting uh, point, the general idea is that, first of all, the eyebrow will be a little bit, just a bit wider than the eye itself. So that means that if my eye is like in this width, so when I'm creating the eyebrow, I will probably make it a little bit wider. So that means that maybe I'll go a little bit outside this line and also a little bit outside this line. I'll just make it a little bit wider. 
That's one thing. And another thing is that I usually, I will divide the eyebrow into thirds. And what you will see that we will have two thirds, two thirds basically that are in this, they are basically those two thirds, they make the thick part of the eyebrow. And the, the outer third, it will make the part that may basically becomes like thin that is basically tapered out and also it goes in an angle and if you will actually try to see the different planes of the head so we have the front plane of the head and we have the side planes so usually like this uh, outer third usually it's where it breaks and kind of starting to go into the side plane of the head uh, so it's another thing that uh, we can take into consideration. So this is usually what I have in mind when I'm drawing the eyebrow. And uh, then if I'm taking uh, those basic concepts, I can make an eyebrow which is very, very thin and maybe is a little bit rounded. So even if I'm like, let's say I'm creating like this shape of an eyebrow, which is very thin and very rounded. But it's still like the same principle because I can still divide it into thirds. And then I have like this outer third, which is breaking the angle, changing the angle and is kind of tapering out. Um, so that's about it. But let's talk a little bit about the eyelid, which is uh, even more interesting. Um, so basically the eyelid is just a piece of skin that covers the upper part of the eyeball but for some people the uh, we don't really see like the entire eyelid so it also changes uh, due to uh, uh, ethnicity so uh, let's say that in, cer in certain areas uh, the eyelid is kind of more uh, stretched and doesn't really fold inside the eye uh, and in certain areas, the eyelid will really fold inside the eye. And it also been affected from uh, the age of a, of a person. So let's take me, for instance, like, I think for me, like about 10 years ago, like the top part, like the, the skin from the eyebrow, sometimes the skin from the eyebrow can actually go down and cover a little bit of the eyelid uh, so we don't really see the entire eyelid we can actually see the skin of the eyebrow goes a little bit down and sometimes it can actually change the silhouette the the outer line of the of the eye uh, so let's say that if i saw the entire eyelid i will i will see the eyelid here and maybe it goes under the bone of the of the eyebrow which i will explain later and then i will see like the eyelid here but if i'll draw an eye of someone that is a little bit older maybe just maybe the skin of this eyebrow goes a little bit here and it actually covers like a big part of the eyelid so that skin, we can imagine like it's a part of the eyebrow, the eyebrow, and it has like this volume lines to it. So in that case, we will actually see like the inner part, like we will see the eyelid only on the inner part of the eye and less on the outer part of the eye. And, and it's something that we can really see with other people. Like with other people, we can actually see like this, a skin like dripping down the eye and can actually cover even the eye like part of the eye itself and not only uh, the eye so in, it's another thing that uh, we should be aware of now i do want to show maybe um, what do you say let's check i, I haven't checked um, if, if we have any participants uh, so uh, i don't know maybe so you will let me know if we if we do yeah i will uh, okay so Actually, I wanted to show um, also 
how the eyeball is placed inside the, the skull. And once you understand how the, how, how the eyeball is placed inside the skull, it actually helps to understand better the eyelids and the eyebrow. And also it will help to understand how to draw the eye uh, from a side view, from a profile view even better. So I think that I will create maybe um, Mm -hmm. So is there like a quick way for me to hide all the layers uh, all at once? No. That's a good one, though. So it's uh, next in the list, please. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, let's do a quick scope. Um, so let's say that um, I will do one from the side and one from the front. So let's say that this is like the orbital. This will be the shape of the orbital. And then we have like the bone this bone around here and this would actually be like the cheekbone and this would be the nose or the bridge of the nose okay so something like that so let's say this is part of the skull and I also will create maybe a quick side view right here. And I'm doing it fairly simple, just like for us to have something that we can imagine. Okay, so let's say this is the skull from the side view. And what I want you guys to know is the eyeball doesn't really sit in the middle of the, of the orbital. It actually goes a little bit closer to the upper part of the, of the orbital. And it's even um, a little bit covered by the bone of the eyebrows of the top part so let's say that if i'm creating the eyeball the way i want you to imagine it is that if you look at this skull you will see that basically the top part is being covered and on the bottom part we do have a little bit of space left there and that that is something you can actually take your finger and actually you can feel it. So that means if you right now, if you would like to try it, if you take the finger and put it under the eye and you press a little bit under the eye, you can really feel, you can dig your finger under there. But if you take the finger and you will put it on top of the eye, then you will see you can't really go under like the same way you can go under the eye you can't really like press on top of the eye you will feel like up, how the eye really goes under the, the the bone of the eyebrow so we have a, a little bit of space underneath and not, we don't have any space uh, on top of the eye at all and it actually uh, it's important uh, to the structure that will we'll see later on. So that's one thing that we need to understand. Uh, and that means that first of all, right now, if I'm imagining the bo this bone, I can really imagine that this bone have like volume lines. And I can really imagine the way the eyebrow sits on this bone. So that will be our eyebrow and it really sits on this bone. 
And then let's uh, pick a different color. Now let's imagine that the lid is actually this piece of skin that goes on top of this eyeball and it covers the eyeball and it goes underneath it goes underneath the bone of the eyebrow that basically where we get this fold whoever has this fold that where we get this fold that goes on top uh, of the eyelid and if someone has like like a droopy eyebrow so that means that the skin on top of the eyebrow basically drips down and covers and covers maybe i'll do it in different colors so it will make more sense so that basically means that this part is dripping down on top of the eyelids and it covers the eyelid a little bit and that is the reason why we see like the inner part of the lid uh, more uh, in this case than the outer part but basically this fold what i want you to imagine and this fold that we get like on top of the lid is just like the lid goes under the bone of the eyebrow now if we look at the structure from a profile view there's a few more things that we can learn from it one thing is that how much from this eyeball from this sphere how much is inside the skull and how much is outside the skull like how protruding this shape is so we know that like the 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 orbital is kind of synced in right it's kind of synced in it's a dent in the skull but if we look at like at someone we can actually see like his eye kind of protruding kind of it's we can see the shape of it coming down, like uh, coming out, like it's rounded. So how much from the eyeball we can actually see? So with most people, and it's only from observation, I didn't read it, uh, I didn't read it in any book or something. It's just me coming to conclusions from like staring at people weirdly. Um, so it's a part of the basic, job part of the job and that's what i'm trying to to, to tell the, the the officers there yeah, it's, yeah. it's not what you think it's just <laughs> it's i'm not, an artist and, it's, uh, it's my job yeah, yeah exactly so basically if we think of the eyeball as a sphere try to again divide it into three thirds and imagine that those two thirds are inside the skull and one third of the eye is protruding outside okay and if you want some someone that has like really like protruding eyes and then you can stick more of it outside i guess but the way i try to think about it is like again we said that the this bone of the eyebrow of the eyebrow they it actually covers a little bit from the eyeball so i'll imagine like the eyeball kind of here and we have about a third of the eyeball coming out and two-thirds of the eyeball are inside are inside the skull maybe i will take it just a little bit just a tad down so it won't be that covered so that's more like it. Now, let's also like make those spaces a little bit darker so we can see better what I want to show next. So that's basically how I imagine like how much of the eyeball will be sticking out. And it's not only from a side view, it's also if you draw someone from a, a three quarters view, it really helps to know that now if i'll draw the eyelids on top of it then we will come to realize a few things you will you probably if you kind of look at different tutorials or different art books maybe you came across 
uh, this explanation that when you draw the eyes uh, from a side view, it kind of needs to be in a diagonal manner. So let's say this is the eye. So I'm really trying to make, and this is the eyebrow. So I'm really trying to make the eye like kind of diagonal uh, shape to it instead of doing this, which is incorrect. Okay. So the reason it goes diagonally it because obviously the eyebrow is the, the part or the shape that is most protruding to the outside. But also the fact that the eye is not in the center of the orbital and it goes a little bit more uh, to the upper part of the orbital. That is part of the reason why, let's make it with a little bit of brighter color. That's the reason why here the lid the eyelid goes a little bit like that, more to the outside. And we know that it's a little bit more arced, more arched. And the bottom lid goes a little bit like that. And uh, that's the main reason that we have like this diagonal shape uh, with the end result of our eye and also something that is cool to note uh, a lot of people when they're drawing the eyebrow from uh, a three quarter view they are doing this they they think of the space that we have like between the eyebrows and they leave this space here but what you need to know uh, to to note basically or to know is that the space between the eyebrows it's only on the front plane and actually, the eyebrow is more protruding than the space between the eyebrows. So that means that if you look at someone from a complete side view, not almost side view, like a complete side view, most of the time you won't see the space between the eyebrows. It's like if, you, if I'm looking at, a, I don't know, at a piece of paper. If I'm looking at a piece of paper and it's this uh, wide, right? So if I'm looking at this paper from the side, it's not like half of the paper. If I'm looking at the paper from the side, I can barely see the width of it. Okay? So you need to think of the space between the eyebrow. It's only on the front plane. But once you go to the side, you won't see that space on most people. So that means that when you draw the eyebrows uh, from a side view, you can feel free and confident to actually make it go all the way to the contour line of the head. And if you look at different references and you will see that you do see the space between the eyebrows in a profile view, that will be due to one of two reasons. The first reason, it's not a complete profile view. So try to see if you also see like the other corner of the of the lips, or maybe you can see a little bit of the other arbor or whatever. So it's not a complete profile view. And the second reason, if some people have like really, really rounded forehead, then we will be able to see like the space between the eyebrows also in the profile view. Uh, but if the forehead is not that rounded, um, most of the times we won't be able to see it. So kind of um, to summarize everything. So if we're looking at the uh, thinking of the eyeball inside the orbital, it actually goes a little bit towards the upper part of the orbital and it's covered a little bit with the bone of the eyebrow. Uh, and basically when the lid uh, the eyelid, the top eyelid covers the upper part of the eye. It goes inside and under the bone of the eyebrow. If the eyebrow has like this dro droopy skin, then that skin can sometimes cover the outer uh, part of the eyelid or the eye itself. And, and, and if we look at the eye from uh, the profile view and we think the way this eye placed inside the skull, so on most cases, it will be like two thirds of the eyeball inside the skull and one third of the eyeball outside the skull. 
and that will be part of what makes uh, the shape of the eye from a profile view to end in a diagonal, uh, diagonal uh, angle. So I really need to drink something. <laughs> did, I've been doing nothing. Uh, if anybody watches our streams pretty as regularly or catches these things, they'll start to notice that this is just one of those things that I do, but I always have like three drinks. I've got like a LaCroix, I've got a coffee, and then usually like a tea or something. Man. So I'm just always sipping on something. <laughs> I, I can I can talk so much, I sometimes forget to breathe. I can, yeah, well, I can just like go on and then I go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the magic, man. Well, that's, that's, that's what makes you so great at this. Your, your, your ability to, to describe these things, I think, watching a lot of this, I think what's incredibly valuable for all, even for people who do understand some of these things, or maybe all of it, the, your, the way that you're measuring things, I find very interesting. Um, and being able to provide just a, a quick tool as a guide to measure based on the angle and, and just these quick tips make a huge difference in execution and, and just one last thing you have to make a decision on, like being able to define the width of the brow over the eye. Um, you know, those things that we do kind of understand is like the corner of the lips kind of tend to line up somewhere with, you know, within that section of the eye and applying that same technique to the brow and the placement of the eye within the head. I think all these things are really, really incredible rules and, and guides. Yeah, you know that uh, the faces that the, the face that you most of the people see the most it's actually their own face. Um, so what I do want to maybe um, thanks, man. So what I do want to uh, maybe tell our viewers to to try to do is actually compare what they know from their own face to different people. So even when, even when someone is drawing from observation and he looks at different people and he's drawing different people, basically at the end of the day, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we wash our face, and every time we want to go outside and we change our clothes, we look at ourselves probably more or, or even like, like try to, to study or, or observe like uh, our face probably more than any other face. Um, and that's, I think that is the main reason, you know, they say that, uh, when people draw characters, like when artists draw characters, they kind of draw the, a little bit, they draw themselves in, in every character. And I see that when I draw characters, there are certain attributes and features, which I kind of intu intuitively, intuitive, intuitively, I kind of like throw inside without even thinking about it. Or sometimes I just find it like more appealing. And then when I started to like really examine it, uh, I just realized that basically uh, it's kind of, I, I throw in features that I know for my own face. Um, and, and it's really good to compare what you know from your own face to other faces because right because then you can really really note like the differences and really know that okay so not every eye looks like my eye and not every nose look like my nose and um because you know i i have like i think every every year i have like uh, maybe like a hundred students new students like that goes uh, that go through my courses like every year and thanks, uh, Jonathan. thanks for joining us thanks jonathan i really appreciate it um and something that i really noticed is that when my students when i ask them to draw characters from imagination they usually do the same thing they usually draw characters that are kind of or similar to the way they look mm -hmm or they just like you know they throw a little bit of their features or their attributes to to the characters as well and i think it's something that everyone does in in a certain way like kind of throwing it here or there things that he knows from his from his own face uh, which is kind of interesting 
And you know what else is interesting? That every time when I teach and I talk about uh, proportions and ideal proportions and average proportions, then every time when I finish a class, I have like a, a, a student approaching me and say, you know, I, I, I uh, realized that my ears are not in the correct height, <laughs> uh, <laughs> according to, uh, in comparison to, to my eyes. And uh, really, people really take it to heart when you say, oh, uh, the, the ear is ending exactly in the same height as the eyebrow. And, uh, and then someone sees that his ears are a little bit higher or lower or his nose a little bit. So uh, that, that's kind of interesting. Oh, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, and it, it definitely is. I think looking back on maybe first to say, like, I, I kind of came up in the same in, in this like core education and learning these tricks. And these are sort of like the, um, the these concepts of breaking down measurements and, and understanding anatomy in a way where you can break it down in 2D, where you're not talking about it as a uh, scientifically you know you're talking about it from an artistic perspective it's like it part of it is is understanding the science and the the just the biology but then it's breaking it down into concepts that an artist can apply without having to go into like such you know specific information and you know like these these the ways that you're measuring things some of this stuff i'm i'm learning that i i haven't actually seen described in this way but these are things that kind of get you to, and this is just my take. I'd love to hear what you think about this as like the, you know, the master artist, but these are the core things that get you to about 65, maybe 70% of like the creative process. You can continue to reapply this stuff over and over and over, and you're going to get great results. You'll, you'll be, you'll be in like the, you'll, you'll be like in the intermediate category and heading into like that master level. But going back to your original one of your original streams that you did with us, which was the the character proportions and character design overall, when you start classifying the the unique sort of shapes of a person uh, of the body and like what defines a character, that's where you're number one, you're starting to break away from just what you see and you're starting to envision the some of these key aspects that that create an identity for a certain type of character whether it be a villain or a mob boss or you know somebody who's kind somebody who has kind and usually that relates to certain characteristics or aspects but maybe that's just the eyes but when you start to break away from these guides and the, these guides and rules you can lay as foundation but you know those strict rules and where the top of the ear is supposed to sit i think where the master level application comes in is like when you start to break those rules a little bit, you start to push it a little bit more and exaggerate it and, and be willing to do so. It's like the rules are there to help, you know, lay a foundation, but the next stage of evolution in the creative process is pushing beyond that. So once you really grasp this, that's where I imagine when, you know, you're teaching and you're talking about this stuff and you're applying this in your own work, but I would imagine that in, in a lot of cases, like, you know, the highlight clip I chose for this beginning one was you talking about like, letting your stroke kind of just go. And and I thought that it, it's such a quick comment, but I find I really that, liked it. I really good. Liked it. I'm glad I was paying attention. I was watching and I was like, that's a good thing to share because that there's sometimes where you kind of have to just let things go and you kind of have to push things a little bit or not be so strict on this, the science and biology and the measuring, because that's when you get very mathematical art. And that to me is like, Maybe that's we've I brought this up before. I think you and I've talked about this, but that's kind of like Da Vinci to me is in a way that kind of an artist, incredibly talented, but more scientific and mathematical than just pure gestural kind of organic creative, you know. And you could probably find tons of other examples of you know mathematics and in, in in classical paintings and art, but that is a real thing, you know. You can deconstruct this stuff down to a, a principle if you'd like, but. If you want to go to another place, I think that's where the fun can be um, in, in kind of just letting yourself go and be free a little bit, too. I think also, I, I, I actually, I had like this discussion with uh, <clears throat> in one of my classes, like uh, just the other week. I think that uh, something that is not talked about enough uh, is that people are basically they dissect information differently. Um, and 
when you talk about like different approaches to learning how to draw or paint, uh, all those approaches, they have like this very black and white approach. So if you're taking like, let's say a classical approach to do like drawing a uh, figure drawing in, I don't know, in the ac academy in Italy, or if you're taking uh, the classical approach, like uh, in, in Russia, the, the, the artist in Russia, it's kind of a different approach to drawing. And if you look at uh, maybe approach that uh, you see that is more like modern today, that they've been taught to animators that come from maybe like 3D art, and it's it's kind of a different approach when they actually render things and they think about different passes, like a 3D software. Like, okay, I'm doing the reflection, I'm doing the ambient occlusion, I'm doing the... All those approaches are basically, they are talking to someone that has like a certain way of thought. And I think that what can be very confusing to, to students and, and people beginning or wanting to learn is that basically they come across uh, this information where, where they find it hard to digest it and to actually practice it and, and bring it to, to to actually to uh, uh, to be practical with it and i think that it sometimes can be kind of uh, frustrating but i think it's important for someone to actually get to know the way he thinks and once you figure out the way your like computer works then you can realize that, okay, this approach is great, but it's not for me. It's not for me because this is oil and I'm water. And it doesn't matter how much I would try and go and practice. I've seen students that uh, actually like, we call it uh, in Hebrew, we have a saying, uh, full, uh, uh, like full gas in neutral. So it's it's like you you're just revving it, but you're not just going anywhere. revving it, but you're not going anywhere. And I've seen students that I, I'm not I'm I'm not like even exaggerating. Like for ten years, they are doing the same thing. They are taking like they work with a certain uh, maybe teacher or even different teacher, but they are in certain approach, and they're doing the same thing. And they are very like uh, they're not lazy at all. They're like they're working really hard and they're sketching and practicing and try to copy what the teacher shows or what the book shows or whatever. And you look at their work like five years, 10 years after, and it, it looks the same. It's like, man, you did, you've done all this work all this time and you haven't made any progress. Now, sometimes it's a little progress, but and, and and I know that maybe for some people listening here, it it kind of doesn't make sense. They it, they they will find it hard to believe that someone can actually go and practice ten years and not make any progress. But believe me, it's a real thing. And and the reason being is that this person basically he he has his own way to to like how we dissect. Uh, information and how he observes knowledge and unless he will find the teacher or the method that basically uh, he can like understand uh, then he might like waste a lot of time like you know sometimes um i have like students coming uh, for my courses or i used to to teach uh, private lessons, I, I don't anymore, but, um, and sometimes I, I, I can talk with someone and just with talking with him and give him like a, a quick exercise to see the way he thinks, I can tell him, you know what, man, I'm not the right teacher for you. Let me give you a phone number of my friend. I think uh, it will be like a better fit for you because, um, some people, let's say, they are great artists when they draw from observation. 
Uh, and it's not only the method, it's actually the way the mind works. So let's say they are really good with observating and they can tell the different tonality of different uh, uh, shapes and they can really tell the angles and they can really tell the exact sides and proportions and different stuff, which all involves in drawing from observation. But you tell this man to close his eyes and try to imagine like a cube spinning or try to imagine a different and sometimes people don't have like the ability to imagine like 3d stuff inside their mind in their mind's eye but they can really draw well from observation and i can tell you that for myself i'm really really bad in drawing from observation i can like do something decent maybe I should practice it more, but it's something that it's actually hard for me. And a lot of time, if I look at something and try to really draw it from observation, uh, and I will draw the same thing just from my mind and the understanding of it, uh, of the shape, of the perspective, of the different things, then a lot of time I will achieve, most of the time, I will achieve better result doing it my own way. Because it's just how like my mind works uh, and i think that once you come to realize who you are as an artist and how your mind works and how you basically digest information then it will do so much good for you because you will you will be able to know who is the right teacher for you and what is the right approach for you and maybe you won't feel so frustrated that you can do one thing because you know that you're really good in doing another thing. You know, like, um, I think it was about 10 years ago, maybe even more, I think 15 years ago. Uh, I'm getting old. So <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think 15 years ago, I, uh, I flew to this uh, 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 a workshop that uh, went for a few days and there was uh, a few artists that uh, made uh, like this workshop and i was very very excited i was following all those artists and i really admired them uh, till this day uh, and i i was so excited i really waited like to to hear them and see how they do things and how they explain things and i remember that the first artist uh, that presented in this workshop uh, he came from a classical background. Uh, he drew like he came from uh, oil painting. Now he works digitally and he's an amazing artist. Uh, but I, I waited so much to see how he would explain how he approaches things. And I swear to you, uh, I think like in the first 20 minutes of the workshop, the first 20 minutes of him, like after like, saying like the you know the opening blah blah when he actually started like explaining and drawing and painting i think that after 20 minutes i said to myself oh man i won't be able to learn to get anything from it i will get inspiration i will be inspired uh, i will definitely enjoy myself uh, I will definitely be like get like the, the the itch to draw or paint, but I won't get everything, anything that I will actually be able to implement and yeah. to do myself. Yeah. And well, I was gonna say the, and I that to, to that point, I think it, you know it does it a big part of everything is you know I think the general underlying guideline here is like to know yourself as an artist and, and to, to to I think the best artists end up being the people that are most open to exploring new things and, and evaluating and growing. It's like, if you're not good at, if you're not doing something the way that you want to, you know, seek the right mentors and to your point, like f looking for the right people that, that speak a language that resonates with you for some people. And I think a part of it is attention span. Um, a part of it is it, it, like, as you said very well, I think the the way that the mind works and each of us has a different, like, I guess need or maybe it's more of a desire as a way to receive information but sometimes you know the it, i think what tends to work more often than not is you know thorough description and thorough breakdown 
Now, there are some people who, for some reason, don't like that. I mean, I think it comes down to attention span where it's like they just want the quick, short solution. Just give me the answer so I can do it. But that mentality right there is, and that's probably why when you, if you have students or you talk to that, you know, you're like, I'm not the right teacher for you. I think more often than not, it's people that think that way. And it's like, if that's what you want, you know, there are people out there that are going to give that kind of information to you. And maybe that works well for them. Maybe they just want that one answer. But I think when it comes to this kind of stuff, particularly in the early stages, it's always about you need somebody who is going to inspire you, but also is going to break down this stuff in a way that is actually digestible. That's so important. And to be patient and take the time to actually listen to that information. Like, and, and I've been in those shoes before where I just wanted to get good at stuff and I wasn't actually paying attention. There's a difference between listening and watching something and actually listening and paying attention to it and taking it to heart. And I think the, the key factor to that is a willingness to be open about it, to not to, to remind yourself that you don't know everything and that you need this information from them. So you need to like lock in and, 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 you know, absorb it, fully absorb it. And it, the, the, we, we all have the ability to be on that like wavelength, but our ability to absorb the most of it and actually put it into practice is a skill that you have to practice. And that's very, very important for anybody who's struggling with creative process to understand. And the more you, you know, you just, you might have to try it over and over and over. You might have to go through 20 different instructors or teachers or mentors or training videos online to find somebody that does it for you. But as long as you can seek to be open about it, it eventually it just, it locks in and something will, will click. No, the thing is like our mind, like the mind is invisible. You can't see your mind. Now, the mind is is actually like for me the, the way I describe it. It's like the physical body. What the, what do I mean by that? So, like everybody has like his own like physical attributes, right? Like his physical structure. So let's say that um, let's say that you are a short dude and you want to be an NBA player. So that means that no matter you will find the best trainer, you will have a one 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 on one sessions every day with Michael Jordan. But if you are very short, you probably will get better at playing basketball. You won't be an NBA player. So the body, it's something that we can see. I can look at the mirror and I can see my attributes. I can see my attributes. I can see which sports I can play well, probably, and which I won't. So in that manner, I mean the mind is invisible. You can't see the mind. And sometimes it's not like to, to get to know your body and what sport will be, will be more uh, fit to you, will fit you better. The mind, you really have to kind of track and really uh, observe the way you do things and the way you think about things. Um, and it's the same thing. Once you get to know your mind, you need to pick the right sport. So maybe drawing from observation is not the right sport for you. Maybe drawing realistic uh, paintings is not the right sport for you. Like, you know, I had like a few chances um, to... to um, to speak, let's say, with uh, Stefan Silver. Let's take him, for example. I really like what he does. And his characters are so simplified. And they they have so many characters to them. And I imagine that a guy like Stefan Silver probably won't be a fine artist. Uh, but he, do, he does what he does so well. I once told them, man, I see you drawing a character from a profile view and putting the same eyes in the same side, and it looks so cool. And when I do it, I get like those ticks, and I just can't do it. So there is, you know, you, you have like these attributes, and I think like for a guy like Stefan Silver is a great example for someone who really understands what he does well, and he goes all the way with 
what it does well is it's, it's not getting distracted by everything else that we see on Instagram and on Pinterest and we want to know how to do this and this and this and this and we try to compete with everybody. That's a really frustrating way to, to approach art. Um, so, yeah. No, it's a really good point. And I think you're right. It's, it, 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 depending on your motivations and what's driving you, what you're seeking to do with art and, and, and creation. Some some folks, you know, just do it to, we've got tons of people in Magma that that a part of it is a social experience. You know, part of it is drawing together with friends and, and maybe they don't care about the quality of their art. And this doesn't really apply to them. And others that are, you know, to your example earlier, people that spend, you know, years, many, many years making the same mistakes and not growing, I think, you know, m more often than not tend to just have a, a certain motivation where they it's it's like a and and, and I, this is I, I'm not saying this to be unkind. It's it's sort of like a it's a it's a delusional thought process where you think yourself it's like to your point, not knowing your mind, not knowing not asking any questions and not or not spending enough time asking enough questions to grow. It's like a stubbornness in a way. And we all have these characteristics in us. Every human being does. It's a matter of just visibility and, you know, coming to some conclusion or some understanding of what's actually going on. And sometimes it takes people their whole life to figure that out. I think artists have a better chance to do that sooner in life than most other people because a part of this whole process is about figuring that part out in order to be good at what you're doing and steven silver we've had on the podcast and i've talked to him a bit i know you know him well and, and you've worked with him for a while and and you know him better than i do but my short observation when i met him was like that's his story you go back to how he got started and how you know a lot of artists that tend to find a, ni a niche he 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 just was he started doing it when he was a kid and he just kept doing it and he was motivated his motivations were that that's what he wanted to do characters and and you know caricatures rather and that evolved into animation and and you know some really great animated um shows and and content and stylization he's developed a brand and he's amazing at that and he continues to excel at that he's fulfilled by it i think that's a big part of it too is like what fulfills you as an artist some people those of us that have short attention spans we kind of just keep doing stuff it's like and i count myself as one of those people like I'll get fixed on a project for like maybe a month or two. And, and I've kind of been in like a creative dry spell for a while just because I haven't been primarily focusing on art as like what I'm doing other things and, you know, got other stuff going on. But I, I that's how I am when I get into those modes where I'll get fixed on something and then it's done. I'm like, okay, what am I doing next? Like, I just want to make stuff. That's my motivation. It's like, I just... And I can think back to when I was a kid. I I used to live live outside with duct tape and just stuff, and I would just jam things together and make things and build stuff. And I just loved doing things. And I still am like that as an adult. And so I've 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 come to accept that I'm not going to be that Michael Jordan. Like a long time ago, I was like I wanted to be you know character artists, and I wanted to work in 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 you know very high level visual effects and. I got great visibility on what that world was like. And I was connected with a lot of those folks and heading in that direction. And I just realized, you know what, that's not for me. And, and it was like a, it was like a big release. It was, a, it was like, Oh, you know what? Now I don't have to worry about that anymore. Like I can focus on what I am excelling at and do that well, which for me is more just helping facilitate other people do those things. You know, I think it's a very specific type of person that's, capable of staying at that high level professional artist stage and keeping up with it and and balancing yourself well that for me just I, it wasn't going to fit my persona and and i learned to accept that but you know it's in in and not even accept it but to like feel feel great about it you know like which was weird but yeah it's i think all those things are are so so important and i, I appreciate your willingness to talk about all these things too it's i think it's great for people to hear from professionals like yourself that you know, have really been through it. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it, and uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to with you, man. We can uh, we can go on forever, right? Yes, we definitely could. We definitely could. We've got. I mean, we've got plenty of time now that now that you're back on the schedule, um, back to our our bi bi weekly schedule. So in in two Tuesdays from now, um, Udi will be back. We've actually gone through the gamut now. I was looking at uh, just content from you. And we've we've covered um, hair, eyes, 
we, we started with character design. We've gone into ears, um, almost all of the aspects. I think, you know, what we'll, we'll figure out what subject to, to move forward with and announce to you guys next week or, or soon for those that are catching up with this uh, post live stream. But thank you, Udi. The, this series has been fantastic and these breakdowns are unbelievable. The, the community has, has been uh, showing their praise and, and commenting in Discord and talking about this stuff and how great and helpful it is. So, you know, your efforts are appreciated and, and definitely looking forward to the next one. Thanks, man. I enjoy it and I appreciate it uh, as well. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Magma Classroom and we will catch you next time. Bye bye.